But as soon as the two walked inside the apartment, they discovered a scene that was horrible. Lacey was found lifeless. Lacey had been strangled with an electric cord. It's Lisa with The Search. How is everybody doing today? I hope everybody's had a wonderful week since we have seen each other. We are going to be talking about a case with Lacey Gaines. She is a 20-year-old that was murdered. If this is your first time joining us on The Search with Lisa, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and likes and comments if you have anything that you would like to ask. We upload every Thursday at 8 p.m. If I seem a little off tonight, I am not my regular self, okay? I have been suffering. I feel like it's the flu, but we are charging on, you know, the, nothing stops just because we get sick. These are things I really do not want to miss. I am very passionate about it. If I seem a little nasally or just a kind of not myself, I apologize, but I am still excited to be here. Like I said, we are going to be talking about Lacey Gaines. And at the time, she was living in Justice, Illinois. What I want to tell you, though, is a little bit about her. Most of her life, she spent in Creek, Illinois. It's a little, like, small area in the south, like, suburbs of Chicago. It's kind of, like, known for its views. I believe, like, Dixie Highway. For three years, she attended a high school down there in Illinois called Trinity Lutheran Day before transferring to Grand Park High during her senior year. And I thought about that. That had to be an adjustment, you know, to go from one school then your senior year transfer. You know, it's kind of like, oh, why did we have to? But I think we'll get into that a little bit. People who knew her best describe her, like they said that she was very loyal, very intelligent, knowing the story. And I think by the time that you hear it all, you will tell it she was so driven. Nothing was going to stop her. She had goals. You could tell she had family values. She wanted to do always the right thing. She really tried really tried. Nothing was going to stop her until someone decided they wanted to. One good thing was that she could speak fluent Spanish and always had an eagerness to like expand her knowledge. Now, for one thing, I want to talk about this is around like 2007, all right, 2008 period. When you're looking for jobs and you're looking to do things, back then it was a it was great if you were bilingual, if you especially. And like now it's a lot more common, but back then it wasn't as common. So that was always like, I remember in that time that was on everything, if you were bilingual. So that was definitely the turn and she was. So that made her available for a lot of more opportunities and very much looking forward to her future because of that. Let's kind of get into her story. Things took an unexpected turn when at 16 years old, Lacey met Daniel Sanchez, who was in his 20s. They began dating much to the disapproval of her parents, okay? Like, uh-uh. Her friends were not happy about it. Her family was not happy about it because she was 16 and he was in his 20s. So there was an issue with that within the family. Just upset, you know, and the friends were very worried. Like, why are you involved with this? And yes, she was eager to grow up, to go on, to do things but also the character I don't feel they felt very safe with. Because they wondered, you're in your 20s. Why do you want a 16-year-old? You know? 
I mean, that's just a real question. And is it legal? Just from the beginning, it was a downhill dating experience. The relationship wasn't great. Daniel would try to be possessive and control her. Of course he did. That's why he wanted a 16-year-old, right? He often became jealous of, like, her male friends who she would speak to at school. She was hindered by him. He was on top of everything that she did. And it's like, uh-uh, you can't breathe like that. And that's what I want to talk about, too, with her character, like I talked about at the beginning. She knew she was in this situation, but she wasn't, like, cowering down about it. It was like, what have I got myself into? And how am I going to get out of it? And I don't want to, like, involve my family too much. She was wanting to just be independent and accept I did this. She also did get pregnant and he was the father of her baby. So there was things to come. Not letting the circumstances dampen her future, she began inserting her independence by working two restaurant jobs. She worked at Vicks on Main, which was in Creep, and Maxwell in Beecher, Illinois. I want to hope I'm saying that right. It's either Beaker or Beecher that overlapped one another. So this was between the years of 2005 and 2008 in order to provide the upcoming baby. So let me tell you, things weren't starting off well, but she knew she had a job to do and she was going to do it. That already tells you what type of person she is. I too was a mother at 20 and I know what it's like. You're not gonna depend on anybody. Like you got something depending on you, you gotta get out there and hustle. Get that education. Do what you got to do. Yes, life's going to be harder, but you got to do it. So I very much related to her in this. The hard times of relocating to a new school and becoming pregnant. She graduated, gave birth to a baby boy named Connor. After graduating, though, Lacey's parents, which Jeffrey and Gilda Gaines was their name, purchased a home and a safe community for her which I think is amazing. While living there with Daniel, she was supporting the family by taking on a full-time position as a waitress at the Kingsbury Waffle House, which was in a town, Flossmore. Basically, what they did is they got her a home that needed, you ever see like the flip houses? They got her a home that really needed to be renovated and the dad did it for her. Trust me, it was not for her and Daniel. It was for her and that baby. So I know these parents. You could just tell the type of great family that she come from. But Lacey's relationship with Daniel quickly began to deteriorate. He became very physically and mentally abusive. A co-worker noticed that she would come, like she would come to work. Okay, and she would have bruises all over her arms. After seeking guidance out of fear, her aunt, Sherry Simpson, Lacey terminated the relationship through the troubles would not end there. It was just getting started for her. You know, there is actually a little YouTube, a little segment where you hear her aunt talk. And your heart will just go out to her. They knew that they, they just were not fond from the get-go. People knew he was being physical. But does being physical, you know, make you a murderer? No, it doesn't. But it sure puts you high up on the list, doesn't it? And it sure makes people not like you and not want to trust you at all. Let's just keep going here. After the breakup, of course, there was a custody battle, which only made things more stressful for Lacey. Nonetheless, she tried to remain positive, just like she always does. Pick, fix it up. All right, let's roll. You want to do this? I've got a house. I've been maintaining. I'm doing things. Now you want to cost me money for an attorney? Let's roll. Let's do this. She tried to remain positive. She took steps to improve her future. She eventually moved out of the home, though, that her family purchased and took up a residence at Sunset Lake Apartments. 
to start new. I don't know if there was just other reasons that we don't know or why she decided to do that. Maybe it was closer to things. I don't know. But maybe the bad memories in there, you know, PTSD is a real thing. I'm just saying possibly could be a reason. I don't know. That's just allegedly speaking. But that's what she did. She moved over to Sunset Lake Apartments. It was kind of known for drugs and just crime over there. And they didn't feel good about that. You know, she had her child. We're not happy about this. Of course, they accepted it. They never turned on her at all. While adjusting to her new living arrangements, she met a guy named Juan Valdez, who her friends and family did approve of. They liked him. And the two actually, like, started living together. Guess what? Daniel got a little angry about that. You know, baby daddy. Daniel's anger and jealousy seemed uncontrollable once again. He was aware of her lifestyle, not wanting to let go of the past relationship, began stalking her and would send harassment stuff, death threats. He forever was angry, always like going at her. And Lacey was actually fearing for her safety of her son too, not just her, but also of her son. And she sought immediate help. She got immediate help, sought out what options she had. Was she going to continue contacting her social workers, letting them know what's going on? But this did little to prevent Daniel's absurd rage that he had. Six days after Lacey's birthday, she had turned 20 years old. It was a cold evening on Monday, December 7th. 2009. Lacey had a doctor's appointment at 3 p.m. that day, but had a peculiar feeling. She just had a weird, I don't know, weird vibes. Thinking it would be less stressful and safer in general, she asked her grandma if she could babysit Connor for a few hours, and she happily accepted the offer. Of course, grandma did. It's like she had a feeling, like I said, stalker vibes coming from Connor's dad, Daniel, that day, you know, I say it's mom's intuition. And she's just, you know, she called out grandma and grandma got Connor. Later, we'll be very thankful for that. A few hours later at 7.10, Lacey's new boyfriend, Juan, arrived home accompanied with a female friend of both of theirs. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary when they went in there. Everything was okay. But as soon as the two walked inside the apartment, they discovered a scene that was horrible. Lacey was found lifeless with blood all over the floor. Basically, you knew she had just like passed out. It was very evident that she had been attacked. Something bad had happened and Lacey was no longer with us. It was just a horrific scene. Juan immediately dialed 911. He couldn't speak a lot of English. Now remember, Lacey could speak Spanish. So they were able to get along, you know, great with that. But he called 911. But he couldn't speak English, so the female friend that was there had to actually, like, assist him. He, they're frantic. Everybody's frantic. We've got a language barrier. I mean, you can only imagine the craziness going on, not expecting anything like this. The police, medical dispatcher, ambulance soon arrived over at the crime scene. Lacey was rushed to Advocate Christ Memorial Hospital in Oak Lawn, and this is in Illinois, Oak Lawn, Illinois, where she was pronounced deceased. Of course, this is very devastating, very devastating. Who would have done this to her? An autopsy was soon performed pretty quick, and it was determined that Lacey had been strangled with an electric cord, but a knife wound that caused a four-inch gash on the left side of her neck that was ultimately what what took her by the looks of things and the what they could determine they feel that the perpetrator was right-handed because the four-inch gash 
was in the left side of her neck. According to the medical examiner, the murderer is approximately about the same height as Lacey. There was no signs of sexual assault or defensive wounds, which probably means that either it was very unexpected or quick. But I will say that they felt by that significant evidence that actually speaks volumes. Back at the apartment building, police sealed off the area to conduct like their full examination. You know, they put the tape up, they do the full thing, the crime scene. There was an investigation showed there was no signs of forced entry on the property. No property had been stolen, leading law enforcement that Lacey probably knew her killer personally. While they were looking in the rooms for evidence, they managed to retrieve some important items, including a kitchen knife with a 10-inch blade that was later confirmed to be the murder weapon. Though the police considered Lacey's case to be an isolated incident, still the, the residents around were like, whoa, we just had like a big serious murder around here. And that always sends the neighbors in frantic and upsets them, especially people if they knew her, other single moms, single people living there, anybody. You know, it does cause a serious hype within the area. And remember, it's known to be a little more crime, drugs within the community. So, you know, is the person living in the community? Even though they claim it was isolated and they feel that they can narrow it down, it still had people in a frenzy. Now, there was some compelling information starting to come in. People in the building actually were saying that they claimed that there was a maintenance man working in the complex that were known to be pedophiles and peeping toms. With the latest tragedy, though, those rumors blossomed into fear and families were afraid to let children go out, roam outside to people's other houses. And I hear this happen in cases over when people don't know when it happens right there, especially in apartment buildings. And you don't know who it is. It really runs through. It's usually something you never forget, especially if you're that child. And then as children, you're told, you know, you can't go out for this reasons. The young ones are like the boogeymen, you know? You have to think it affects so many people other than just family. This is a horrific crime that is definitely needing justice. The police did what they could to assure the residents now that they had no reason to fear a mad killer was loose but they did little to stop the worrying. With the belief that Lacey's murder was personal, Police Chief Robert Genfield had over 30 detectives from Southwest Major Crimes Task began probing her history. They rounded up friends, family, and prior boyfriends to piece together the information that would lead to a potential suspect. That's when more pertinent information came to light regarding Lacey's ex-boyfriend, Daniel, the father of her child, okay? Of course, he was considered prime suspect in this case. Yet, after hours of interviewing and interrogation, he was ruled out, ruled out as a suspect. I think people were kind of shocked about that. Probably about a year later, hardly any new news information trickling. Despite the detectives working tirelessly, Lacey's case soon turned cold. Not necessarily put away, but tips had stopped coming in. About a year has gone by. There's not really any new leads going on. Potential suspects were unearthed, including some of the rumored maintenance men from her apartment complex. But they all had people from her past that might have had some form of motivation to commit such a heinous crime. They were ruled out. About a year later, almost two weeks to the day of Lacey's murder, 
friends and family came together to do a candlelight vigil on Saturday, December 4th, 2010, where she passed out flyers, brochures to keep her unsolved case in the spotlight. Despite the blistering cold weather, it was very cold. We're in Illinois, December 4th. So the people that all participated and many people showed up to pay their respects and support. Lacey's brother closed off the evening by gathering everyone together and saying a prayer. It has now been close to 15 years. The case still remains unsolved with no progress being made aside from Lacey's case being uploaded to Unsolved Mysteries website on July 1st, 2014. So guys, please go check that out. Look that up. Tips and leads have run dry and family members feel as if a law enforcement have completely disregarded her case. Nevertheless, Lacey's family still strives for justice and continues to make sure that she is not forgotten. Her family still resides in Justice, Illinois. They believe as long as they continue to keep her case burning, that they're bright amongst the public. They have the optimism to see their case resolved. They haven't given up hope despite all the difficulties through the years. Just as Lacey is so often described, they remain loyal to see through this darkness. Once a kid, when you have cases like that, we get a lot of information uh, at the beginning. And the people that want to cover, we kind of have duplicates. Yes, we put our own twist on it or maybe something we might catch or stands out to us than others. But we all come together somehow, some way when we tell this story to find that it still deserves justice. Now, it was done in an apartment. It had to have happened. During the, she had an appointment at 3. And the boyfriend was there at 7. And it was committed. You know how much activity is going on between those hours? Now, I feel like somebody does know something. As we are here in January of 2024, there has not been any evidence that has been willing to stick far as to give clues or to basically have anybody up for trial. It's basically a who done it. There is somebody that knows who did it. If you know something, please come forward. This case doesn't have a lot of coverage and I want to do cases that don't have lots of media because these are cases that are not being heard. We need to get people talking. We need to get this going. If you live in the Oaklawn area or the side areas of Chicago, I know that there is an absolute lot of crime. I know we're going back to 2009, but if you've heard anything, I ask you to please call your local police, call the tip line. I will list all the information down in the description of where you can contact. Before I end, I always give a ribbon of prayer. So tonight I give one to Lacey Gaines, December 7th, 2009. She was 20 years old. I appreciate you being here tonight. I ask that you please subscribe. Leave a comment below what maybe you think could have happened. Maybe what they possibly should look into. If there was anything, maybe if you live in that area, that you could recommend. Again, all the information will be in my description. Everybody be safe, and I will see you on the next search. Good night, everyone.